Right. Hello once again, and welcome to this virtual neighborhood. We are in our, I think, our hundredth and seventh episode right now, and we are nearing a conclusion as we work to go through this last of the Narnian Chronicles. This is the last battle. I know it's kind of like backwards when you see it like that. Um, but you can see the, the unicorn right here. We're going to meet him. Uh, his name is Jewel. Um, but this is a very interesting story. Um, it's going to be different than any of the other stories that we've heard. And it speaks about the last days of Narnia. So get ready for an adventure that will bring us through sadness, through darkness, through adventure, but ultimately to a light that we can't even possibly begin to comprehend. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We ask that you bless us and help us to be able to always seek you, Lord, in all things, especially through the intercession of St. Pius X, uh, the wonderful Pope that um, wanted to renew all things in Christ. And so, Lord, we ask that you renew our hearts, our minds, everything that we are, and we give them over to you, Lord. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so let's think of where we've gone so far. The Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, the great battle that reminds us of Jesus dying on the cross and rising. We have Prince Caspian, the moment in which the Narnians go undercover or underground in the midst of a, a terrible Lord Miraz, um, who, uh, who ultimately wants to destroy and exterminate all the Narnians. We have the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, that great sea voyage all the way to the eastern edge of the world into Aslan's country. We have the Silver Chair, the moment in which Eustace and Polly um, go on an adventure sent by Aslan in order to reclaim and to, to, to rescue Prince Rillian from another evil witch and enchantress. We then looked at the horse and his boy. We looked at the story of Shasta and Aravis and Bree and Huynh. And we heard that story of, um, of them ultimately getting to Narnia and how Aslan was at their side all the time. And then we just finished yesterday, The Magician's Nephew, which is about the creation of Narnia, the very beginnings of Narnia, and the things that would happen that would lead us to the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. If you remember that tree that fell down, well, that, that was planted, and then after a storm fell down, after it was a big, big tree for many, many years, that there was that beautiful Narnian magic within it, and that tree was turned into a wardrobe, and it was through that wardrobe that the professor, you know the professor in The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe? Well, he was the young boy Diggory in, um, in The Magician's Nephew. And so that becomes his house that the four children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, get to stay at and enter into Narnia for the first time. So now we get to the last battle. And this is what it says here. It says, Narnia, where dwarves are loyal and tough and strong, or are they? Where you must say goodbye, and where the adventures begin again. The unicorn says that humans are brought to Narnia when Narnia is stirred and upset. And Narnia is in trouble now. A false Aslan roams the land. Narnia's only hope is that Eustace and Jill, old friends to Narnia, will be able to find the true Aslan and restore peace to the land. Their task is a difficult one because, as the centaur says, the stars never lie, but men and beasts do. Who is the real Aslan and who is the imposter? Will we be forced to bid farewell to Narnia forever? That's what we're going to be going into. So get ready as we enter into chapter one of 
the Chronicles of Narnia. And here's a map, actually, just at the very beginning. We have up here, it's all backwards right now. This is the land of Narnia, right here. These are the wild lands of the north. That's where the silver chair happens. Then we have, this is Archon Land, we heard about in The Horse and His Boy. And then this is Kalorman. If you remember, the Kalormans were the ones we met in, um, the ones who lived, remember the Tizrock and all of those people that um, were part of uh, Erevis's uh, family there, those warlords that were kind of like the guys from the Arabian Nights. So they're the ones who live in the south there. So if you remember those things, we have Kalorman, which was the enemy of Narnia, and Tosh was the god that they worshipped, Archenlan, which was connected and allied to Narnia, and then the wild lands of the north where the giants live. Okay, here we go. Chapter 1 by Cauldron Pool. In the last days of Narnia, far up to the west beyond Lantern Waste, and close beside the great waterfall, there lived an ape. He was so old that no one could remember when he had first come to live in those parts, and he was the cleverest, ugliest, and most wrinkled ape you can imagine. He had a little house built of wood and thatched with leaves, up in the fork of a great tree and his name was Shift. There were very few talking beasts, or men, or dwarves, or any people of any sort in that part of the wood, but Shift had one friend and neighbor who was a donkey called Puzzle. At least, they both said they were friends. But from the way things went on, you might have thought Puzzle was more like Shift's servant than his friend. He did all the work. When they went together to the river, Shift filled the big skin bottles with water, but it was Puzzle who carried them back. When they wanted anything from the towns further down the river, it was Puzzle who went down with empty panniers on his back and came back with the panniers full and heavy. And all the nicest things that Puzzle brought back were eaten by Shift. For as Shift said, You see, Puzzle, I can't eat grass and thistles like you, so it's only fair I should make it up in other ways. And Puzzle always said, Of course, Shift, of course, I see that. Puzzle never complained, because he knew that Shift was far cleverer than himself, and he thought that it was very kind of Shift to be friends with him at all. And if ever Puzzle did try to argue about anything, Shift would always say, Now, Puzzle, understand, I understand what needs to be done better than you. You know, you're not clever. Puzzle. And Puzzle always said, No, Shift, it's quite true. I'm not clever. Then he would sigh and do whatever Shift had said. One moment early in the year, the pair of them were out walking along the shore of Cauldron Pool. Cauldron Pool is the big pool right under the cliffs at the western end of Narnia. The great waterfall pours down into it with a noise like everlasting thunder, and the river of Narnia flows out on the other side. The waterfall keeps the pool always dancing and bubbling and churning round and round as if it were on the boil. And that, of course, is how it got its name of Cauldron Pool. It is liveliest in the early spring when the waterfall is swollen with all the snow that has melted off the mountains from up beyond Narnia and the western wild from which the river comes. And as they looked at Cauldron Pool, Shift suddenly pointed his dark, skinny finger and said, Look, what's that? What's what? said Puzzle. That 
yellow thing that just come down the waterfall. Look, there it is again. It's floating. We must find out what it is. Must we? said Puzzle. Of course we must, said Shift. It may be something useful. Just hop into the pool like a good fellow and fish it out. Then we can have a proper look at it. Hop into the pool, said Puzzle, twitching his long ears. Well, how are we to get it if you don't, said the ape. But, but, said Puzzle, wouldn't it be better if you went in? Because, you see, it's you who wants to know what it is, and I don't much. And you've got hands, you see. You're as good as a man or a dwarf when it comes to catching hold of things. I've only got hooves. Really, Puzzle, said Shift. I didn't think you'd ever say a thing like that. I didn't think of it. I didn't think of it of you, really. Uh, why, what have I said wrong, said the ass, speaking in a rather humble voice, for he saw that Shift was deeply offended. All I meant was... Wanting me to go into the water, said the ape, as if you didn't know perfectly well what weak chests apes always have, and how easily they catch cold. Very well, I will go in. I'm feeling cold enough already in this cruel wind. I'll go in. I should probably die. Then you'll be sorry. And Schiff's voice sounded as if he was just going to burst into tears. Please don't, please don't, please don't, said Puzzle, half braying, half talking. I never meant anything of the sort. Shift, really, I didn't. You know how stupid I am and how I can't think of one, of more than one thing at a time. I've forgotten about your weak chest. Of course, I'll go in. You mustn't think of doing it yourself. Promise me you won't, Shift. So, Shift promised. And Puzzle went cloppity-clop on his four hooves round the rocky edge of the pool to find a place where he could get in. Quite apart from the cold, it was no joke getting into that quivering and foaming water and Puzzle had to stand and shiver for a whole minute before he made up his mind to do it. But then Shift called out from behind him and said, Perhaps I'd better do it after all, Puzzle. And when Puzzle heard that, he said, No, no, you promised. I'm in now. And in he went. A great mass of foam got in the face and filled his mouth with water and blinded him. Then he went under altogether for a few seconds, and when he came up again, he was in quite another part of the pool. Then the swirl caught him and carried him round and round and faster and faster till it took him right under the waterfall itself, and the force of the water plunged him down, deep down, so that he thought he would never be able to hold his breath till he came up again. And when he had come up, and when at last he had got somewhere near the thing he was trying to catch, it sailed away from him till it got it till it too got under the fall and was forced down to the bottom. When it came up again, it was further from him than ever. But at last, when he was almost tired to death and bruised all over and numb with cold, he succeeded in gripping the thing with his teeth. And out he came, carrying it in front of him and getting his front hooves tangled up in it, for it was as big as a large heart hearth rug and it was very heavy and cold and slimy. He flung it down in front of Shift, and stood dripping and shivering and trying to get his breath back. But the ape never looked at him, or asked how he felt. The ape was too busy going round and round the thing, and spreading it out and patting it and smelling it. 
Then a wicked gleam came into his eye, and he said, It's a lion skin. Um, uh, oh, is it? gasped Puzzle. Now I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, said Ship to himself, for he was thinking very hard. I wonder who killed the poor lion, said Puzzle presently. It ought to be buried. We must have a funeral. Oh, it wasn't a talking lion, said Shift. You needn't bother about that. There are no talking beasts up beyond the falls, up in the western wild. This skin must have belonged to a dumb, wild lion. This, by way, was true. A hunter, a man had killed and skinned this lion somewhere up in the western wild several months before. But that doesn't come into this story. All the same, Puzzle. Or all the same, Shift, said Puzzle. Even if the skin only belonged to a dumb, wild lion, oughtn't we give it a decent burial? I mean, aren't all lions rather, well, rather solemn? Because of you-know-who, don't you see? Don't you start getting ideas into your head, Puzzle, said Shift. Because you know, thinking isn't your strong point. We'll make this skin into a fine, warm winter coat for you. Oh... I don't think I'd like that, said the donkey. It would look, I mean, the other beasts might think. That is to say, I shouldn't feel. What are you talking about, said Schiff, scratching himself the wrong way up as apes do. I don't think it would be respectful to the great lion to Aslan himself if an ass like me weren't about dressed up in a lion's skin, said Puzzle. Now, don't stand arguing, please, said Shift. What does an ass like you know about things of that sort? You'd know you're no good at thinking for you. You know you're not good at thinking, Puzzle. So why don't you let me do your thinking for you? Why don't you treat me as I treat you? I don't think I can do everything. I know you're better at some things than I am. That's why I let you go into the pool. I knew you'd do it better than me. But why can, can't I have my turn when it comes to something I can do and you can't? I am never... am I never allowed... To do anything? To be fair. Turn and turn about. Oh, well, of course, if you put it that way, said Puzzle. I tell you what, said Shift. You'd better take a good brisk trot down river as far as Chipping Ford and see if they have any oranges or bananas. But I'm so tired, Shift, pleaded Puzzle. Yes, but you are very cold and wet, said the ape. You want something to warm you up. A brisk trot would be just the thing. 
Besides, it's market day at Chipping Fall today. And then, of course, Puzzle said he would go. As soon as he was alone, Shift went shambling along, sometimes on two paws and sometimes on four, till he reached his own tree. Then he swung himself from branch to branch, chattering and grinning all the time, and went into his little house. He found needle and thread and a big pair of scissors there, for he was a clever ape, and the dwarves had taught him how to sew. He put the ball of thread, it was a very, it was very thick stuff, more like cord than thread, into his mouth, so that his cheek bulged out as if he was sucking a big bit of toffee. And then he held the needle between his lips and took the scissors in his left paw. Then he came down on the tree and shambled across to the lion's skin. He squatted down and got to work. He saw at once that the body of the lion's skin would be too long for Puzzle and its neck too short. So he cut a good piece out of the body and used it to make a long collar for Puzzle's long neck. Then he cut off the head and sewed the collar in between the head and the shoulders. He put threads on both sides of the skin so that it would tie up under Puzzle's chest and stomach. Every now and then, a bird would pass overhead and Shift would stop his work looking anxiously up. He did not want anyone to see what he was doing, but none of the birds he saw were talking birds, so it didn't matter. Late in the afternoon, Puzzle came back. He was not trotting, but only plodding patiently along the way donkeys do. There weren't any oranges, he said, and there weren't any bananas, and I'm very tired. He lay down. Come and try on your new beautiful lion skin coat, said Shift. Oh, Bother that old skin, said Puzzle. I'll try it on in the morning. I'm too tired tonight. You are unkind, Puzzle, said Shift. If you're tired, what do you think I am? All day long, while you've been having a lovely, refreshing walk down the valley, I've been working hard to make you a coat. My paws are so tired I can hardly hold these scissors. And now you won't say thank you, and you won't even look at the coat, and you don't care, and, and... Uh, my dear Shift, said Puzzle, getting up at once, I'm so sorry. I've been horrid. Of course, I'd love to try it on, and it looks simply splendid. Do try it on me at once, please do. Well, stand still then, said the ape. The skin was very heavy for him to lift. But in the end, with a lot of pulling and pushing and puffing and blowing, he got it onto the donkey. He tied it underneath Puzzle's body, and he tied the legs to Puzzle's legs and the tail to Puzzle's tail. A good deal of Puzzle's gray nose and face could be seen through the open mouth of the lion's head. No one who had ever seen a real lion would have been taken in for a moment. But if someone who had never seen a lion looked at Puzzle in his lion skin, he just might mistake him for a lion. If he didn't come too close, and if the light was not too good, and if Puzzle didn't let out a bray and didn't make any noise with his hooves. You look wonderful, wonderful, said the ape. If anyone saw you now, they'd think you were Aslan, the great lion himself. That would be dreadful, said Puzzle. No, it wouldn't, said Shift. Everyone know everyone would do whatever you told them. But I don't want to tell them anything. But you think of the good, uh, of the good we could do, said Shift. You'd have me to advise you, you know. 
I'd think of sensible orders for you to give, and everyone would have to obey us, even the king himself. You would set everything right in Narnia. But isn't everything right already? said Puzzle. What? cried Shift. Everything all right? When there are no oranges or bananas? Well, you know, said Puzzle, there aren't many people, in fact. I don't think there's anyone but yourself who wants those sort of things. There's sugar, too, said Shift. Mm hmm, said the ass. It would be nice if there was more sugar. Well, then it's settled, said the ape. You will pretend to be Aslan, and I, I'll tell you what to say. Uh, no, 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 said Puzzle. Don't say such dreadful things. It would be wrong, Shift. I may not be very clever, but I know that much. What would become of us if the real Aslan turned up? I expect he'd be very pleased, said Shift. Probably he'd send us the light. Probably he's sent us the lion skin on purpose, so that we could set things to right. Anyway, he never does turn up, you know, not nowadays. At that moment, there came a great thunderclap right overhead, and the ground trembled with a small earthquake. Both animals lost their balance and were flung on their faces. There! said gassed puzzle as soon as he had breath to speak it's a sign it's a warning i knew we were doing something dreadfully wicked take this wretched skin off me at once no no said the ape whose mind worked very quickly it's a sign the other way i was just going to say that if the real Aslan, as you call him, meant us to go on with this, he would send us a thunderclap and an earth tremor. It was just on the tip of my tongue. Only the sign itself came before I could get the words out. You've got to do it now, Puzzle. And please don't let us have any more arguing. You know you don't understand these things. What could a donkey know about signs? And that is the end of this first chapter. The next chapter, The Rashness of the King. Very interesting uh, friendship between uh, Shift the Ape and Puzzle the Donkey. That's a kind of friendship that we don't ever want to have. If you notice how Shift sent Puzzle into such a dangerous moment, sending him into that, that whirlpool of cauldron pool, he almost died in there. And then when he got out, the ape didn't even ask how he was but only was just looking at the very thing that he wanted. If you ever noticed in a lot of these stories, you have these particular characters who like to use others just to get what they want. Think about the, the witch in the last story, using Diggory or using Polly or using Uncle Andrew. Think of Uncle Andrew himself. Think of these different characters, and, and this is something that comes up a lot. You have those that seem to pretend that they're friends, and yet they're not really thinking about the good of the other person. They're more thinking about, how can I use this person to get what I want? How can I use this person, how can I use this donkey to have oranges and bananas? And not think about how 
how much suffering Puzzle had to endure in order to try to help his friend. But notice how Puzzle, he lets the ape do his thinking for him. That's another thing we have to be careful of, is sometimes there might be someone in our life that says, you're not very smart, I'm smarter, and so I'm going to think for you. Sometimes that can be a very dangerous thing to be because then we start just going along with it and we don't always know if this person really has our best interests in mind. So you have Shift, who uses others, but then Puzzle the Donkey, who allows Shift to think for him. And what is going to happen? Notice also how there was that thunderclap. There was that earthquake. Do you think that merely was a sign that was saying to Shift and Puzzle, good job from Aslan? Notice how Shift turned it around. Something that came and he said, well, I was just going to say, if Aslan wants us to do this, then send that. But notice how it came first and then he made that up and made Puzzle believe that. But something very dangerous is, is underway. Remember how Puzzle said, you know, we're doing something dreadfully wicked. And that's to take this lion skin, to put it on Puzzle, and then to make Puzzle look as though he's Aslan. So we'll find out what happens because of this, this particular moment of things are good in Narnia, but they're doing something wicked. And let's see the consequences of what happens with that next time. So we're going to be um, starting up again on Monday. And we have about, I think, 16 chapters. So 15 more chapters left. So we're going to have three more weeks, Monday through Friday. And then we're going we're gonna to be able to say farewell to Narnia. All right. May the Lord bless you and pour his mercy upon you this day. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye.